recording, so everything you say can and will be used. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> podcast are coming back to you from the common desk here in deep ellum that is not a sponsor they're not sponsoring this uh this podcast but we are going to give them a shout out because they've got an awesome space here and they have given us the opportunity to use it um so here we are and uh today hanging out with a uh, a very good friend of mine that um we met a while back 2013 ish sometime around 2013 or 14 and uh, I, we we met at a theater where um, this guy he got, he got up on stage and he told his he told a brief like a little eight minutes sec eight eight minutes uh, life story yeah man a life story in eight minutes like a like a little eggshell version of a life story then I was like I got to meet this guy and uh, we met and we become friends and we've stayed in touch ever since and so this is my good buddy John Matthews. What's going on there? With one T, Matthews with one T. That's right. Right. That's a that's a that's a common mis, misconception, right? People. Yeah, that's a it's two, a rarity. Those two T's. What what is that origin on that? What is that? You know the I, the origin was uh, I got it when I was a baby. No, <laughs> I'm just I don't know what the origin is, man. I, I guess I'm uh, Irish. Oh, is that is that a you're uh, Irish of Irish descent? Uh, of Irish descent, yeah. But I'm more like a mutt. You know, yeah, I got a little bit of everything in me. Okay, okay. Well, I got the old uh, Spanish Italian blood in me, and uh, that's where I got the name of the Tamale Mafia from because the tamales from the Spanish and the Mafia from the Italian right uh, stuck it together there, the Tamale Mafia. But uh, yeah, man, I want to. I want to talk, I mean, obviously I want to talk and I just want to talk and like we normally would talk. So I don't want there to be a lot of uh, pressure around this, but, but for the sake of, of our listeners getting to know you the way I got to know you, um, I want to go back to the beginning and I just want to kind of walk through the, uh, the arc of your storyline because the eight minute version blew my mind. And I was like, dude, in eight minutes, this guy has experienced more shit yeah. than anybody I, I know ever. And so you have not had the easiest path. You've not had the, uh, so what they say, the, the world handed to you on a platter. You know? I never had anything handed to me. It was always... Uh it's more like, uh, I guess that's why I have all the may nots on my head. <clears throat> you know what may not is, right? I don't. It may go down, it may not. <laughs> but uh, anyway. How many of them did not? <laughs> uh, quite a few. <laughs> I, I, I don't do a bald head well, but uh, you, you do. But Yeah, well, I didn't have much of a choice, man. My my hair was uh, was falling out fast. You know, I got the thing in the back that started. It was really just like leaving me right here, a little bald spot. And I was kind of doing the little comb over thing. And I was like, I really don't want to be the comb over guy. Yeah. But what happened was, dude, right here in the middle, it started moving back this way. And so it kind of became like two little horns <laughs> like this, you know? And I was that like, That would be kind of cool. Dude, no, it wasn't cool. It wasn't. It looked ridiculous. If you're going to be the comb over guy, you got to go from the right to the left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a friend when I was a kid, and his dad had a comb over. And I, never, I didn't know what a comb over was. I never, it was just his dad's hair, you know? And it wasn't until we went uh, swimming for the first time on one summer, this dude jumped in the pool, and when he came back out, his hair right above his ear on the right side was touching his shoulder, and the whole top of his head was bald. And I had no idea that he was even bald. He would just like take it. He just stuck his hand under that flap of hair and <laughs> swooped it back over the top of his head, and I, it blew my mind. I had never seen a comb over before. Yeah, you you might have been thought twice about diving in the water after seeing him come up. Whoa! Yeah, I want, I want to do that. Yeah, 
Continue. Yeah, so you were saying um, uh, about um, uh, the, you wanted me to go back to the very beginning. I guess the very beginning would be, um, <clears throat> I, I guess my earliest memory would be of my stepfather uh, dragging my mom across the floor and shoving her head into the stove because the beans wasn't hot when he got home. Um, he was a very, very abusive uh, alcoholic, but uh, th that that wasn't all. He was also uh, a pedophile. You know, he uh, I've seen him, you know, rape my my little sister and my little brother and my my older brother. <clears throat> the only reason that uh, all I got was you know beatings was because I could run. You know, my older brother he had a, a hip degenerative you know disorder, and so he couldn't run, and so he could he was you know fair game. Um, you know, I remember seeing uh, Bill. Um, I walked in the house, and I was walking through, and I walked past the hall, and I looked, at, you know, down the hall, and I seen my brother bent over the bed, <clears throat> and Bill, you know, you know, doing his thing, and well, Bill, he looked at me, and you know, did his little finger, you know, his come here, and uh, I remember saying, uh, uh and I ran out the back door, and then ran up to the tree, and I stayed up the top of that tree until. Till my mom got home, and uh, when she got home, I, you know, she told me to come on down. I, I came down. We never talked about it. We never. Uh, How old were you when you ran up that tree? I was seven years old. Mm. I was, uh, you know, I, 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 I smile today. Um, I look at people, you know, seven-year-old kids now, and uh, at seven years old, I, I'd ran away from home, <clears throat> and uh, I was living in a hole in the ground. It was the older kids' fort. What it was was, a, you know, a deep hole in the ground with a, you know, a piece of uh, metal over the top of it and then dirt on top of the metal. Uh, and so, there were, you know, there was a little hole where you could crawl down into it. <clears throat> well, I lived in that hole for about, I guess, 15 days or maybe, you know, about half a month, I, I guess. You know, I, it was, I was young, so I really didn't, you know, do time. You know, I didn't know how to, you know, gauge time. I just knew that... Uh, I knew at, at seven years old, you, you can't be seen during the day if, if, if it's school season, and, you know, if school's in, because people notice children uh, if they're not in school. <clears throat> I was invisible, and people couldn't see me, you know. Uh, I knew all the rules, and I, and I obeyed all the rules, you know. Uh, the only reason they pulled me out of that hole is because I had to go over a fence every day to get to, to where it was, and there was an old lady that would, you know, that lived there by that fence, and she had watched me every day going over that fence, and I guess called the police on me. But anyway, um, I was invisible. Like I said, you know, I learned early on that uh, people notice you if you're not in school. So you, during from 7 to 3, you stay off the streets. After 3, you can go anywhere you want. You're invisible. But after 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, when it turns dark, people notice you. If you're a little kid on the street and it's after dark, you're no longer invisible. People see you. So I knew that when dark got there, to get off the street, get in that hole and stay there. Nobody would see me. And so uh, this is the way I lived my life. Uh, you know, back in the 70s, you'd go to, did you know that in the 70s, McDonald's threw away their hamburgers every 20 minutes? Um, they, would, they had them on a heat, under a heat lamp, <clears throat> and after 20 minutes, it didn't matter whether they were still good or not, they would put them in a bag and throw them out. Well, I learned that early on that I could meet them at the back door, and that was my eats. You know, I could live on McDonald's. <clears throat> the chicken place too. They throw their chicken place. They throw their chicken away at the at the end of the day. You know, and uh, uh, I'd if I was there by the door, I, I could get it. And uh, okay, let's let's slow down a little bit. Sure. You you put a lot of information out there, and I kind of want to want to dig into it a little bit um you you're from texas right you're born in texas no i was born in florida but uh i moved to texas early on i've, I've lived in texas arkansas alabama mississippi um and louisiana so did this happen in texas uh, this all happened in texas yeah okay down in houston texas okay and and so your your mom had you and your brothers and your sister me and my brother first okay. and then had homer and michelle later you know my two younger siblings and were those siblings bill's kids or yes they were bill okay bill's kids. so bill was the guy that was a real asshole right 
Uh, more than that, yes. Yeah, okay. And so when he came into your life, how old were you? I was like five, I guess it was. Around five years around old? Around five years old. I remember that uh, I, it was only significant because I remember that uh, I, my, my, they came and got me, uh, and um, I had lived with my grandma up until that time, you know, my grandmother. And that was the, you know, that, I feel like that was the only time in my whole life that I, that I was ever, you know, loved, you know, that somebody, you know, that loved me. Okay, and, so before, before Bill came into the picture, you lived with your grandmother? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And my grandfather had died early on, so I, I, it was just me and my grandma. Okay, and you were just a little guy? I was just a little guy. And life was grand? And life was grand. And then you turned five? Yeah, and then uh, my <clears throat> mom married uh, Bill, and uh, then we moved to, I guess it would be Rosenberg or Pearland or somewhere over there. I, we lived in all of them, Pearland, Rosenberg. And in Houston. Okay, and then so you're five, and then and then does the the beating stuff happen? Start happening right away? Right away. That's right. That's uh, that's what I'm saying. My first memory was you know right after I got there, you know, uh, him beating up my my mom. Well, um, I I tried my very best. I would try very hard to stop him. But he would always, I was, you know, I was little, you know, he would hit me and I'd, I'd go to the ground or he'd, you know, I, I went to the hospital so many times from him hitting me, busting my head, you know, one time he stabbed me and, uh, and uh, under my arm here, I still got the scar, but I mean, <clears throat> every time we went to the hospital, you know, I had to make, you know, he'd make up some story to the doctor and, uh. And the doctor would listen to him, to his story, and the doctor would ask me, is that what happened? And, of course, I'd shake my head yes, because I knew that if I did the right thing, he wouldn't put me no more that night, and I'd get a Coke. You know, back then, we didn't get Cokes. The kids, we, we, you know, my mother got to drink Cokes, but none of us kids, we, got, we had to drink water. So it was, uh, it was a treat. Mm. You know, it was almost like I had to take the whipping and the beatings to get a treat. And so, you know, it's... That was like his payment, his way of telling you he was sorry or whatever. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for keeping your mouth shut. Here's yeah. a Coke. Mm -hmm. And my mom would say, he's not going to do it anymore. He's not going to do it anymore. And, and every every week it was the same thing over and over and over again, you know. I'd try to protect her and, he'd, and you know, I was the only one that could, you know. I mean, there was nobody else. It was, you know, my, my older brother, he, he wasn't going to, you know, he couldn't, you know. <clears throat> and I tried. I tried, tried with all my might, but... I, I, I could I could not stop it, you know, and yeah. my poor mother she, she just took the took the brunt of it, and 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 after at seven is when I ran away, you know, I ran away from home at seven, but I'd already been out on the streets there in Houston, you know, I, I, at five I I ran the streets from from uh, you know daylight to dark, you know, and I did because you were trying to stay away from Bill, right? Right, you were just I trying to stay away. out of his way. Absolutely, I stayed away from home. It's it's as, as long as I could. He he was going to kill your mom, wasn't he, at it, some point? At, yeah, he was. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't die, uh, you know, many times from the beating she got. She she wouldn't go to the hospital, you know. Uh, she, she, she'd she make him take me to the hospital, especially when he'd bust my head open or, you know, like when he stabbed me. I couldn't, they couldn't get the bleeding to stop. And, you know, so, I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was an ordeal, you know, and uh, uh, it was a, uh, you know, uh, I still wake up sometimes and 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 will think of uh, you know the things that's happened and stuff like that. You know, uh, and you know, like a dream or something. Wake up and yeah. you know, with my, holding my breath or or something. <clears throat> but uh, you know, uh, I guess that's why I'm you know I'm dysfunctional. I'm still dysfunctional <laughs> today, <clears throat> going yeah. through life. Um, and um, so well. Going back to the to the when you were seven, there, there was a hole in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. That the older boys had made, like a fort out in the woods, right? And, and you knew about it, right? And the only thing, the only problem with that hole was that at night it was so dark in there you couldn't see, and there would be spiders and everything else, and so I would I would be scared. But I'd go to there's like a Garland store there, not too far from where the fort was, and 
I went in, I'd go in there and I'd get me some candles, you know, and uh, put them in my pockets and I'd, I'd you know, take them to the fort and uh, I had got me some matches and I'd light them candles up about dark and them candles, there were the little bitty ones that are in, you know, just... Yeah, like tea light candles, yeah, little bitty ones. Yeah, and sometimes they were just birthday candles. So, you know, I had to, I had to uh, go to sleep very fast, you know. I'd light them candles so that there would be some light in there. I'd lay down and, fall, you know, make, fall asleep before they went out and when I'd wake up, you know, light would be coming through the hole. Uh, it, so I could, I could, you know, actually see. Okay, so older boys in the neighborhood had dug a hole in the ground, a big hole, mm-hmm. and they had put metal over the top of the hole and some dirt and covered it up, and it was a fort, like an underground fort. Underground fort. Right, yeah. and you knew about this fort. You knew where it was located. Mm-hmm. And they had kind of moved on to a different fort, right? And, they well, they moved on one. to a building that had been abandoned. Okay. left the fort. And so I was the only one that utilized the fort at that time. And in fact, I thought I was the only one that remembered it. You know, of course, I, you know, they, I'm sure somebody remembered it. But so it, when you were out running the streets and so before you actually ran away, would you hang out at the fort? Yep. Okay. That's where I'd go. I'd go. It was like my safe spot. There, I'd go to Reveille Pool. Uh, and, of course, I almost drowned there one time. Uh, <clears throat> that's a whole other story. That's why I believe in angels, <clears throat> you know. I, somebody grabbed my leg and picked me up out of that water. Uh, I didn't know how to spin, swim. I was on a ball. Somebody dove in underneath me, and the ball went out from under me. Mm. And I was in the deep end. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't swim. And so I'm sinking. I'm, I'm trying to scream. And with my last breath, I try to scream to get somebody's help. But as I'm screaming, the water covers my face, and nobody hears me. And so I'm sinking to the bottom of the pool. I can't breathe. I'm, I'm underwater. And somebody grabs my ankle and picks me back up from the bottom of the pool and then takes me over to the side of the pool. And I grab the side of the pool. I'm crying. I look around to, thank, to say thank you to whoever it was, and I'm, there was nobody there. You know? mm. So uh, I know it sounds strange, but there was nobody there. Wow. And, uh, and that's a true story. I'm just, uh, God's honest truth. You were like also around seven years old or six years old or something like seven. that? Seven, yeah, yeah. I was seven. Yeah. So... When was the like the first time you, you you saw your brother and your sister being abused? You were like five. I mean, would that I start right it, away. Yeah, it started. It started probably maybe not right away, but I because I, I really didn't notice it when at first because I was too busy, uh, you know, trying to stay out of his way and and trying to you know the beating start right started right away. You know, he said. Uh, lack discipline and so he was gonna uh, beat the the devil out of me <clears throat> and so he commenced to try and hmm. so and and so at some what was the was it just another beating that you were like okay i'm out of here i can't do this anymore i mean at, at what point do you reach your limit where you're like i gotta go well, I never, I never reached the limit on on the beatings. What I, what I reached the limit on is when he was trying to, you know, do to me what he was doing to my, you know, sisters oh, yeah. and brothers, and uh, I wasn't going to let that happen to me. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong then, and it, you know, it's wrong now. I, I, it's just something that, um, you know, I just knew that I didn't want that stuff happening to me, and so that's when I ran, I ran away, you know. Yeah, you know, then that was like right after you ran up the tree. That was right after I ran up the tree. That's right. I came home that night. The next morning, when uh, I was supposed to go to school, or you know, we was walking or whatever it was. I, you know, I don't know where we was going. I think I was going to Sonny's store. Me and my brother, and I told my brother, I said, "I'm leaving, man. I'm I'm getting out of here." And uh, he said, well, "Where are you going to go?" I said, "I don't know, uh, but I know I'm 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 getting out of here. I'm not going through this. I'm not going to do this." And so uh, on the way back from Sonny's, I had, you know, I, I had friends because I was a neighborhood kid, you know, so I had places that I could go. And so I went to a friend's house uh, on that first night, and uh, they just thought I was staying the night, you know, as just like any other night, you know. I'd, I'd, sometimes I'd go over there, you know, after I'd, you know, been whipped real good or whatever, and, and I'd go over there, and they'd let me stay the night. Well, that first night, I, I stayed the night there. But I also <clears throat> knew, I'd, at, even at seven, I was making a plan. 
I was making a plan to escape. I, I needed to get away. I was going to run. And so the next morning when I was left to go home, I didn't go home. That's when I went and, and uh, went to the, to the fort. And I didn't have to explain nothing to anybody in the fort. In the fort, I could just be left alone, you know, and I didn't have to worry about anything other than the dark, you know. And I could deal with the dark a lot better than watching my mother get beat and stuff like that. You, you knew that it was still going on, though, right? Yes, it was still going you on. You just didn't want to be around it? Right. I couldn't. There was nothing I could do. I mean, he was going to kill me. If, I mean, eventually he was going to get a lick in that was going to... See, I'd learned early on, you know, that I actually got pretty good at, at dodging him. And, and, you know, when he'd hit me, I'd kind of be moving with the hit uh, so that it wouldn't hurt me as bad. And if I could keep that up long enough before he knocked, knocked me down and started kicking me and stuff, if I did that long enough, when he got done with me, he'd be too tired to go back to my mom. And so my whole goal was to keep him occupied and, you know, mm -hmm. get him, tire him out. Uh, and so I guess you would say I was wily. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I, could, uh, I, could, uh, I could bob and weave, you know. And uh, so. It's amazing you had to learn that skill uh, for survival. Yeah, but you'll be amazed at what you can learn if you have to. You know, if, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, how did you learn this? I didn't. I didn't just learn it. Right? You know, you have to live it. You know, you have to every day be, uh, you know, going through something to, to, to really understand even what I'm talking about. You know, uh, at seven years old, I, you know, I learned how to be invisible. Not yeah. real invisible. You know, no, everybody knows you can't really turn invisible. Right. But you can be invisible. Not be seen. Not be seen. That's right. Yeah. You can be right out in front of everybody and nobody will see you. As long as you not, you know, like if you're dirty, people notice you. Or adults will notice a dirty kid on the streets. But if you, if you keep yourself presentable and your clothes aren't too dirty, they just, they look right over you. They don't see you. How do you stay clean when you're living in a hole? Well, when I came out of the, I'd come out of the hole, there was a gas station across the field. You'd go across the field, go over the fence, and go to the gas station. They had a water hose in back, and I could drink out of that water hose, and I'd, you know, I'd wash up. And uh, uh, I wasn't, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't real, you know, methodical and everything, but I, I would clean myself up and, because I knew I had to in order to survive. <clears throat> And so, you know, I, I didn't have many things, so I carried everything I had with me. And, uh, you know, I'd, when I'd leave the fort, I'd leave with everything that I had, and then I'd go and I'd wash my, my, my pants, and I'd, you know, go to the gas station and, and you know, wash my, my hair. You know, I had oily hair back then, and I remember that now. You know, I had really <laughs> oily hair. And that's, you know, significant, you know. That I had to wash my hair because I'd look, it looked stringy. <clears throat> you look like you were uncared for, and then you draw attention to That's yourself. That's right. People notice you. Yeah. You know, if you, if your hair is all you know nice and clean and it's waving in the wind, nobody will see you. But how do you how do you how do you learn these skills as a seven year old kid? I mean, I know it's survival, but what is it? You, what do you attribute that to? How did you figure that out? Well, because people, you know, I figured it out by, tr you know, doing it. <clears throat> I, you know, I'd come out of the hole and I'd walk and I didn't want nobody to notice me. And, I, you know, I was trying to go get some food or something like that. But if I did it during school hours, people would say, hey, what are you doing out of school? You know, or what are, you know, what are you doing? And then I'd have to run. So I knew, I said, okay, during mm. school, stay out of the limelight. So school time. Out of limelight, and it'd be dark, and you out there. Hey, what are you doing out? It's dark right now. Where, where do you live? You got to run off. You know, you got to run again. So next time, don't be out there at dark. You know, I learned it by trial. Mm. You know, by doing it. You know, each each one, each day was a lesson. You know, uh, each day was you know a, a learning experience. You know, if it wasn't for having to cross that <clears throat> damn fence, you'd probably still be in that hole, right? Man, I'm telling you. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be I'd be the old guy in the hole. <laughs> hey, don't go over there. That old dude come out of that <laughs> hole on you. 
He used to have a chain on him, but now he don't. You know, there'd be stories. I'd be a legend. You'd be a legend, man. So I, I want to say, if I'm recalling correctly, Bill was the one that had taught you about the burgers and stuff, right? Nobody said, no, no. He taught me about uh, the food in the dumpsters. You know, oh, he used yeah, to yeah. make me go to, you know, he'd take me with him to go do dumpster diving because uh, my older brother couldn't do it. <clears throat> and my younger brother and sister were too young. And so he would throw me into the dumpster and have me dig out all of the, the, the food, the good food, <clears throat> to, uh, you know, um, uh, put it, he'd have me sack it up and throw it out. And then I'd crawl out of that dumpster and we'd go to the next supermarket where we'd do it again. We'd come home and he'd, we'd, we, he never bought food ever, you know. Meat, everything came out of them dumpsters, you know. Mm. <clears throat> he, you know, he'd look at the date and fill it. And if it, you know, we'd get there early morning, right when they was throwing it out. You know, he, he had it timed. He knew what time to get there. <clears throat> What, did he have a job? What was it? What did he do? He did have a job. He was a lineman. He got paid really well. Really? Yeah, he was a union worker and everything. So wow, yeah. Well, I say wow to that still today. You know, when I think yeah. about it, you know, he made good money from back in the seventies. You know, <clears throat> was he um, an alcoholic or a drug addict? He was an alcoholic. Yeah, every day he'd come home except Sundays. Sundays he wouldn't drink on Sundays, but just about every other day, every day, you know, besides Sunday. He'd drink, you know, he'd, he drank Falstaff beer. I still remember, you know, mm. just like it was yesterday. Uh, boy, get me a beer. <clears throat> and uh, he'd tell me, he'd say, get, get you a drink of it. Or he'd save a little bit in a can. He'd say, finish that off for me. It'd be the hot beer. Finish that off. And I'd, so I'd get to drink that Falstaff and throw it in a can and get him another one. You know, and I was always trying to please him, you know, so that he wouldn't, you know, so he wouldn't, you know, get mean and violent. <clears throat> and I'm still a people pleaser to to this day, you know, trying to, yeah. to, to, you know, things that happened back then carry with you for the rest of your life. You know, you have to, you know, there's four things a kid needs to, to be a productive and, and healthy, and that's love, acceptance, dignity, and respect. Well, you take any one of those four out of the, out of the picture, you're going to be dysfunctional. But if you take three of the four of them, yeah, then you're doomed. Well, I mean... Love, I didn't have anybody to love. <clears throat> you know, uh, my mother, I thought, loved me, and she did. She, she loved me. <clears throat> and, and she loved me. I, I say she, my mother probably loved me more than anybody in the world, but she, she wasn't in a place where she could do anything about it. Acceptance. I wasn't accepted anywhere. I couldn't go anywhere to stay. I'm, my hole is the only place that I felt, you know, like uh, I didn't have to, you know, hide or, or I didn't have to answer questions. Dignity. I didn't even know what dignity was back then, but I'm sure I, I didn't have it. Nobody treated me with dignity. And respect. Nobody respected me because I was a kid. You know, you do this. Back in the 70s, there were no child abuse laws. They, you, you know, you could whip the shit out of a kid and, and uh, nobody would say anything, you know. <clears throat> that, and, and, I mean, and it went on like that for a while. <clears throat> and there was a doctor uh, over there at, uh, I think it was Ben Tobbs Hospital there in Houston. I think that was the hospital's name. Anyway, it seemed like every time I went to the hospital, I had the same doctor that would see me. Mm. And, you know, he put two and two together, and he, he called child services one time, and, and uh, there was, you know, a little file opened on me or whatever, and not child services. They didn't even have it back then, but he called the police and reported because uh, uh, I'd just come in. You know, I'd come in with a black eye and uh, a busted uh, head, and, you know, and my dad told the same, my stepdad told the same thing about me falling down some stairs. You know, we didn't even have stairs, you know, come to think about it. Uh, it's all know, those damn stairs, those man. Damn stairs, yeah. So, I mean, him and them stairs, let me tell you, he done, he's, boy, he's clumsy. He's a clumsy little boy. He can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Mm. So, anyway, that's, uh, yeah, but so... <clears throat> And, and, you know, I remember this, there's different things that I remember. You know, like the first time I ever had a pair of new shoes, uh, it was after I'd, you know, been pulled out of the hole. I was in a, you know, a, a little holding uh, place for kids. It wasn't, a, a, you know, a facility or anything like that. It was just a, a, a lady and a man, and they was watching, you know, a group of kids that, that didn't have nowhere to go. And, well, the guy took me shopping. We went to Kmart, and he 
picked me out a pair of shoes, and he helped me get them on. He said, all right, try them out, see if they fit. And so I take off, and I run through the store. I run up one aisle, and I ran down another, and I came back. I'm breathing hard. And he said, well, how are you? I said, man, they're great. I can run real fast. <laughs> and he said, he knelt down. He said, son, where you're going, you're not going to ever have to run again. Of course, he was wrong, you know, because, I mean, uh, foster homes and boys' homes and stuff, and uh, even back then, there was corruption, and and uh, older kids uh, had to have to, you know, show their dominance, and, you know, children are mean, you know, mm -hmm. kids, you know, youth, when you know, older boys are mean, and and so I went to, you know, from one head knocking place to the, to the next uh, as I was coming up, but, I, you know, these just little significant things like that that I remember. Yeah. So when the uh, the you were in the hole for like fifteen days, right? Yeah. Or so maybe it may have been a little longer than that. I mean, it wasn't more than a month, but it seemed like a long time for me because I was. I mean. You know, I was young yeah, and, on your own, and on my own, and uh, you know, I'd cry sometimes. And uh, uh, well, no, I wouldn't really cry. No, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I would cry sometimes at night. You know? Yeah. Well, I wonder sometimes. You know, uh, did if uh, if you had the ability to cry anymore in those days? Because you know, you can only take so much, and tears will only go, get you so far. And it's that's like that's when I learned that tears don't get you anywhere. You yeah. Know? Shoot, I, I I still cry today. You know, uh, you know when I think of my kids. You know, uh, um, you know I I miss my kids so much there up in Indiana, and I, I love them and I miss them, and uh, you know. I, I, but I live here in Texas, and I have obligations here in Texas, and I, so I can't be at both places. And yeah, so the uh, the old lady there with the fence. That you had to jump to get to the hole. She lived. She lived nearby where you your jumping spot, right? Right. And she had noticed you jumping the fence, and she thought there was something weird about that. Yeah, you know, the first the first week she didn't think not anything weird. You know, I'm just one of the neighborhood kids. But then every you know she'd see me coming in right before dark, jumping the fence and going down that hole. And uh, I, I guess you know she would not even think about it. She'd think that I'd come back out and maybe go home or whatever. But I guess one morning she seen me coming out of the hole mm. early morning and going over to the gas station. And I think that's when she called. And uh, uh, of course, I guess when the police came out or whatever, I was gone or whatever the first couple of times. But they caught me there one time. It was uh, it was after dark. I guess she got them out there and. They were trying to get me out of that hole. I wasn't coming out of the hole, and it was too big to get in it. So it was a it was a sight to see, but a standoff. <laughs> yeah, it was a standoff. Yeah. Coming out, I ain't coming out. <laughs> <clears throat> and so they took me. Yeah, when they pulled me out of there, they they said, "Well, where do you live?" I said, "Not around here." <clears throat> and so so your your thing, you you didn't want to come out of the hole because you thought they were going to take you home, right? And that's exactly what they did. That's what I was just to say. Yeah. And I told them not around here, and of course. Uh, I was a neighborhood kid, so, you know, they just asked, they started asking around. And so, yeah, they took me to my house. And I remember that uh, they asked my mom, they said, well, do you want him back home? And she said, I think it's best if he stays with y'all. Those words echoed in my head for years to come. You know, I thought that my mother didn't love me, you know. I hated her. I hated life. I hated everybody. I didn't want, I didn't want, I didn't, I wouldn't get close to nobody. I wouldn't let nobody become my friend. And I just, I was, I just, I became an untouchable, I, you know, uh, emotionally. But it wasn't that she didn't love me. It was she was trying to give me a sporting chance. You know, she said, son, give everything a sporting chance. You know, no matter what it is. You know, if you can kick a puppy uh, to death, you kick a big dog, and it has a chance to, you know, bite you back or something. Give everything a sporting chance. So I've tried to live my life that way. I don't, I don't, I don't try to hurt anybody. I don't try to. Uh, you know, 
take anybody uh, position and uh, work. I don't try to, you know, I try to stay in my lane, and I give everybody a sporting chance, you know. Uh, you, know you can mess up that chance. You can, you know, <clears throat> do something stupid, you know, and, and you know, um, to me, loyalty, there's nothing, there's no other word in my vocabulary that describes uh, my friends. And my friends, I've, I've got, I can count them on, my, on one hand. But all of my friends, the friends that know me are loyal. And, and uh, they, they know me. Uh, they've kept in contact with me. Like you and I, we, we're friends. We're good friends. And we don't hang out a lot. But uh, we know. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, I know that uh, I can come to you and talk to you. You know, if I ever needed to. I know that, you know... I've got a friend in you, and I know I've got some, you know, friends in Arkansas, Tim and Steve, but uh, <clears throat> that, that they would never turn their back on me either. But you know, these are friendships that that I made, and the people that got, you know, uh, despite everything else, got to know me. And you know, once they got to know me, they uh, they know that you know I'm loyal. I'm loyal to my friends, and I want loyalty. You know, uh, because if a person's loyal to you, they're not going to lie on you. They're not going to try to get you in trouble. They're not going to, you know, put you in situations that you don't need to be in. Um, you can trust them. You can you can go to sleep while they're around. <clears throat> you know, you just can't go to sleep uh, when people's around that you don't know because you don't know what they're going to do. You know, you know they're going to steal your stuff. You, you know, you, you got to watch everything you got because uh, somebody's going to try to take it, and uh, that's my mindset. You know. It's not always true, oh, but it is always true because if you, you, you had watched people steal from you and, and take whatever you got if you're not careful, but uh, you can't leave nothing unlocked. But I found people that you can nowadays, you know, but back then my, that was my mindset, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it took you years to be able to figure out how to trust somebody. Uh, man, I'm st I still have trouble. <laughs> I still yeah, have trouble. I'm trusting. sure. Yeah. So it seemed like the uh, the resounding message left in you from your mom was give everything a, a sporting chance, but the uh, the the message that was imprinted to you early on was I think he's better off if he goes with you guys, right? Right. Yeah. But see, that's what crushed me. You know, that's what made me not trust people because I it thought felt my like mom rejection, right? Rejection. That's right. Yeah. But as I got older and I started, you know, thinking about it, and and I, I did I, my. I, I joined the army when I was 17 years old, and I got my mother. I, you know, of course I kept in contact with my mother and everything, and she wrote me, you know, at least once a week, even when I was in the boys' homes and stuff like that. She always wrote, and uh, so I, you know, I knew where she was at. And at 17, I joined the service after basic training in AIT. Uh, I bought a trailer, uh, you know, a mobile home. And I got her, and I brought her up with me, and she didn't have to go through any more beatings ever, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, she lived with me the whole time I was in the service, and and uh, and you know, basically for the rest of her life, you know, uh, uh, she stayed with my uncle or you know, or, or my grandma, you know. After that, once I got her away from 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 Bill and and uh, you know, life for her became good, you know, again, you know. Uh, but my mother was simple, you know. She didn't know how to do a lot of things. She she wasn't real educated, you know. But, you know, from the time that she came to live with me when I was 17 to the time that she uh, was killed, I, uh, I learned one thing, that my mom had a tremendous capacity to love, you know. No matter what her circumstances was, she always had love to give to me. And to, you know, she always was, you know, tell me that, she, you know, she was sorry about things that, that happened and, you know, and that bothered her for forever, you know, uh, until the time she died, you know. But um, we didn't, we just didn't talk about it, you know. We just didn't sit down and talk about it. We didn't dwell on the past. We just left it back there. Hmm. We just kind of drug it around, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, you it took you a while, but you finally realized that she was 
trying to save your life. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's yeah, yeah. As I got older, and uh, and she came to live with me, you know, she would, you know, she showed me love, and 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 I know that she loved me because, uh, you know, that, like I said, she had a tremendous capacity to be able to love. She'd give you, she'd give me anything. She worked. She 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 wiped old people's butts. Uh, for a living, she took care of the elderly elderly people, you know, as a live-in uh, housekeeper slash, uh, you know, caregiver, and uh, whatever money she had, she gave it to me, you know. She'd give me everything she had, you know, and and of course I would, I would, I would take it, you know, but not. Not during the time that I was in the service, when, you know. It was afterwards when, when you know, I became a drug addict, and and uh, uh, I'd go to her, and and I'd need money because I I needed dope or whatever, and and no, no matter what, she knew what I was doing, and she still gave me the money. She, I mean, she could never say no, mm. and and that's how I knew that she loved me. You know, she she loved me so much that. She would sacrifice everything for me, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to. You think about what she was going through, not just when in, when when she was taking those beatings from Bill, but to watch you take those beatings. I mean, I can't imagine watching my son take a beating. You know, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Um, having that moment where I got to say, Hey, he's better off if he don't, if he's not here, you know, that had to have been crushing for her too. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It was when I realized what she had to go through to let her son go, <clears throat> you know, she just wanted to give me a sporting chance. Yeah. You think, you think that saved your life? Uh, I truly believe it did. Yeah. You think Bill would have killed you? Eventually. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, n the majority of the time, those beatings like that don't don't ever go backwards. They don't ever get lighter. They get heavier, heavier and, and heavier. heavier and heavier. Yeah. yeah. I remember he was teaching us how to play football. And uh, he had had me go out, and he would chunk that football so hard. And, you know, he was six foot two. He, I mean, he's a big old guy. And he could throw that ball. He would hit me with that football as hard as I mean, as hard as he could throw it. And if I didn't catch it, I was a candy ass or butterfingers. And uh, I remember, you know, no matter how hard he'd throw it, I'd catch it. You know, uh, I'd take whatever he could dish out. And I guess he took that as a challenge, you know, to hurt me. And so the more I could take, the more he'd dish. Mm. And it was like a competition, you know. Um, I just, you know, I, I would ignore the pain <clears throat> just to, sh just to, just to be defiant. You know, I, I, I'd got to where I would be defiant. You know, I, I didn't care what he did or, you know, I'm not going to give in. That was my, you know, my mentality there towards the end. Yeah. Did you ever have a... A time or a thought where you were like, "I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna find him." Oh no, <clears throat> I was there on, when he when he was dying. They, uh, he got remarried again. My little brother and sister, uh, you know, stayed up there in Houston. My <clears throat> and now see my sister, she's in a mental institution now because of all the rapings and stuff. But she stayed there. My little brother, he I don't know where he's at. I hadn't seen him in ten years. He he was living on the streets of Houston, and so. I don't know where he's at, and my my older brother died, uh, you know, like six months ago, and so, you know, I know through all this you're saying, man, he he's had a rough time, he's had it bad. I want to tell you, man, I had it pretty good. All I got was beat, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister, she's mentally uh, unstable. She 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 can't live in reality. My older brother, he li he was homeless and lived on the streets and and lived in his own world. My little brother, he was homeless, lived on the streets, and he didn't care, you know, what happened to him or whatever. And uh, you know, I care about all that. You know, I've got, I've got children that love me. I got, you know, uh, I, 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 
made it pretty good, you know. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, all I was was beat, you know. I could take the beatings, you know. I I, I couldn't I couldn't take what they went through, you know. I mean, I'm I'm sure you know you could take it, but I wasn't gonna take it. You know, mm -hmm. that's the reason I ran away. But <clears throat> you know, um, I just I remember when they called uh, Martha had called Martha was his uh, his wife uh, after my mother. And she said, well, Bill is, they said he's not going to make it too much longer. Yeah, so if you, y'all want to see him, y'all better come on. So uh, Homer was living with me at that time. You know, and Homer wanted to go up there and see him. And so we did, and I walked in the room, and he was there. On, you know, he couldn't talk anymore. He had that stroke. He could hear, and he could understand and everything. And uh, I remember this is, uh, you know, this is, I'm so sad. I should not have done this, but I, I did it, you know, and. And I'm not proud of it, but I walked up to him and I and I leaned down and I I, I grabbed his you know his, uh, around his head and I put my you know my mouth to his ear and I said, uh, "Get ready, get ready tonight. Tonight the devil's gonna make you his bitch. Tonight you're gonna get some of what you did. Tonight you're gonna know. You know that song Gun got." got well for about a month, you know. All this stuff, his, or, he, his organs had started shutting down. The doctor said he wasn't going to make it through the night. That song gun got well. Uh, <laughs> he, he started crying. <laughs> crying. I said, don't cry now, candy ass. And, uh, and, and then Martha came in the room, and he was crying. And she said, what did you say to him? I said, oh, just that I forgave him. And, you know, I said, he just, you know. Uh, I, you know, he couldn't write out. I, I didn't, I wasn't worried about him telling on me or anything like that. I just wanted him to know <clears throat> that there is going to be a day of reckoning for him. Yeah. And that, that was it, you know. And um, he, he fought, he fought death all again. You know, he'd give up before I'd got there when I said that into his ear, you know. He, uh, Gave him the, he gave the him, will to he keep gave fighting. Him the will to keep fighting, boy. He got well. <laughs> he sort of. The doctor said it was miraculous. He he, <laughs> he was coming around. I said, wow. I said, well, I bet you he is. You know, and, yeah. You know, every day that you know, every day you know, I, you know, I stayed there at with, at my, at his house. He wasn't at home. He was in the hospital. I stayed there. Martha was there. Homer was there. Michelle was there. And uh, so anyway, every day I'd go in there, I'd see him. I said, today's the day. Today's the day. You know, because every day, you know, he was supposed to, you know, to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was my way of, of, of torturing him the way he tortured me. You know, only I wasn't beating him and, and, and all I was doing was letting him know that he's fixing to be dust in the ground, you know. Yeah. Um, and I feel bad about it, but, you know, I feel bad now about it. But back then, it made me feel good to be able to tell him, you know, today's the day. Today's the day, sucker. You know, you know you're going to get you're going to get it back. Everything you did to us is going to happen to you. Uh, Satan's fixing to do the same thing to you that you did to your kids. You know. Yeah, man. So they... Uh so after after your mom said that he, that you were better off with going with them, they sent you to that home, right, where the guy gave you your pe first pair of shoes. Right. And then he says, where you're going, you're not going to have to run anymore. And then you cried. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I didn't really understand it back then. Yeah. You know, I remembered it. It's one of those significant moments that I remember. You said, where you're going, you're not going to have to run anymore. I said, man, that's great. I'm not going to have to run they're going to put me somewhere where I'm going to be okay. Yeah. So it was, I think I was at, then I went to CRC and, it's, and then, uh, 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 let me see, CRC, Burnett Balin there. And then I went to Summit Oaks over in Laneville, Texas. I went from Summit Oaks, oh, no, from, no, I went to Cal Farley's first uh, before Summit Oaks. And then um, after Cal Farley's, I went to Summit Oaks and, um, you know, um, I I was mechanically inclined. Even back then, I was smarter than 
then uh, not smarter. I was able to put together things in my mind, and they had motorcycles there, but most of them were in didn't work because um, uh, of you know just abuse and stuff over the years. And so I'd ask if there was one, something that I mean, if I could if I could try to fix one of them. And uh, I worked on it for, you know, about a week. I had completely disassembled it, and I, I wanted to see how it worked and everything. And I put it back together, and I got it running, that one. And so uh, it was a XL75, a Honda XL75. It was the first thing, first motorcycle I'd ever touched. And uh, I actually got it working. Uh, we didn't have the web back then. You know, we had AM radio, and that was it. No, <laughs> but anyway, everything was in black and white. Yeah, everything was in black and white. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even the red motorcycle was black and white. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, when I fixed that one, they said, "Well, hey, great! You know, we got a bunch of them." We went to the back room, and there was a whole bunch of them back there. And they, I said, well, "I'd like to try to fix those too." Pretty soon, there was uh, like 15 bikes all running, and they would take us out on on bike rides. You know, we'd get to you know the house. Uh, the house person, the house mother, but it was also men, so it was the house person, would take us, uh, it was usually, um, I can't remember the guy's name now, but I remember the counselor's name was Hal Gibb because he used to call me John Sir, Matthew Sir, because it was, I said yes sir to everything because I'd just come from Cal Farley's Boys Ranch where you had to say yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, and you had to be, they taught you manners and nothing else, you know, and so... Um, and so everything he said, yes, sir, no, sir. And, and so he'd call me, John, sir, Matthew, sir, how you doing? And I'd say, man, I'm doing, doing good, doing good. No matter what I was doing, I was always doing good. So, <laughs> so I found out if I was doing good, I didn't have to stay nowhere and talk to nobody. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you're doing bad, then you got to go see the counselor, <laughs> you know. So you learn early on to, you know, oh, I'm, I'm not doing too good. Well, come on in, sit down, let's talk about it. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So you got shipped around, right, to a yeah, bunch of different shipped, homes. Shipped around, point, point, place, all the way place. up in, until you joined the army, right? All the way up until I joined the army. That's right. And then, uh, well, at uh, at I think I'm gonna say 16. Uh, my uncle JC, my uncle Jim, had gotten me uh, out of the out of uh, Summit Oaks, which was there in Laneville. Uh, we lived. In, he lived in Coolidge. And so he he got me, and and he, I guess he I don't know what he had to do to, you know, the paperwork or whatever back then. But he got me, and he took me to live with them. So I lived with him, my grandma, and my aunt Edith. And uh, uh, you know, for two years there, you know, I, uh, you know, from sixteen to about mid seventeen, uh, he I I towed his tool pouch. You know, he. He had a electric and air business. He was a master electrician, but he, there was nothing he couldn't do. I mean, he was a, a mechanic, a master electrician. Uh, he, you know, he had air conditioning, refrigeration license. He, he sold cars, uh, fixed cars, and and so for I had like uh, a two-year crammed education. You know, I, I was already mechanically inclined from you know doing the. Uh, the motorcycles and stuff at, at some of the oats, <clears throat> but uh, then he started teaching me electrical. So you know, I, I'm a, uh, an electrician now because of it. But um, air conditioning, refrigeration. I do air conditioning, refrigeration. I, I did that, putting myself through college. Uh, you know, so it's hard to miss me. You know, I was a mechanic in the army. I, I did. You know, I was a uh, Light wheel mechanic, power generator technician. So uh, I do generators too. So uh, it, it's hard to miss me. I'm a plumber. You know, I can do plumbing. I'm not. I wouldn't call myself a plumber, but I, I know how to do it. And it, I know, you know, shit rolls downhill and paydays on Friday. And that's about all you got to <laughs> know when, when you're plumbing. <laughs> you know. So, um, but um, I, I became pretty good at plumbing. You know. <clears throat> um, then framing, well, you know, I framed, he built houses, you know. Uh, he, like I said, he was a master electrician, but he was a contractor there, so where we lived. And so uh, I was walking top plate, you know, for almost two years, you know. Top, you know, top plate's what ties the walls and stuff in on the, on, on, uh, 
on front when you're framing the house out. Then you know the the do the sheet rocking. Then I'd come in, cut it in, and you know I lay the plugs in, put the wire. You know I I drill the holes through the studs and run the wire before they put the put the sheet rock up. So from the floor to the door, I could do it. You know, and and that's how you know I live. You know, anything that person needs done, that's I, I do it. You know, I can do it. And not only can I do it, but I do it well, you know, and people, I, I, I work by word of mouth and, and, you know, I keep pictures of all my work and, and so it's, it's, you know, I've, I've been able to make a pretty good living here lately, so. Nice. So that was before, the, before the military, he, he took you in and taught mm-hmm. you all that stuff and then you joined right. the army? Right. And you did that for, for, uh. And three years. Three years. Yep. And then you got out. Mm-hmm. And then you ran into some more problems, right? Yeah, I would say I did. You know, when I got out of the service, it's the first time I'd ever been, you know, uh, free. You know, I was an adult. I was a man. I could do what I wanted to do. So I would bought me a car. I'd saved money while I was in the service. I'd, so I bought me a, a car, and away I went. I was going to see the world. I was going to see the country. And so I started driving around. I'd, You know, when I'd get low on money, I'd stop, and I'd work. I never had problems. Finding work because I was, you know, of course I'm mechanically inclined. I could, you know, I've worked on. Uh, I was a veterinarian's assistant, you know, over in Las Cruces, New Mexico, for for a dairy out there, you know. So I, I you know, worked from a dairy farm to 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 you know framing out apartment complexes. Uh, so it, it didn't matter, you know, if if, it, if there was a help wanted sign, I could stop. I could I could talk my way into a job, and I and I would keep them. You know, the, uh, I never had a job that I was fired at that, you know, they said, well, you know, you got to go, you're not doing well. Everybody, because I worked hard, and and <clears throat> I guess uh, my whole life I've been that way. I, I just, I pour myself into whatever I'm doing because it helps me escape, you know, uh, where I'm at in life, you know, inside yeah. my head there. Yeah. So, you were free? Free. You were a man? I was a man. Do whatever you wanted to do? Do whatever I wanted to do. And you did some dumb stuff? Well, I did some dumb stuff. (laughs) Of course, I thought I was smarter than everybody else because, you know, I I was living in a a fantasy. You know, I wasn't a kid anymore. So, you know, people notice you when you're not a kid, though. (laughs) I'm just joking. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you couldn't slink you around. An, an invisible kid yeah, anymore. I wasn't the invisible kid anymore. Now, no. just to be clear, going back, you you had to fight all the way through your boys' homes, right? Everything, Every, all the time. You were yeah. fighting all the time, the whole time. Because yeah, because you were getting picked on, you kid, were getting beat up, you were getting right. and, and t- trying to take advantage of people, trying to abuse you, right? And but uh, once I reached, I don't know, a certain age, I don't even remember where it was. I, I cocked back and I hit the guy that was, you know, hitting me and, and I dropped him, you know, one punch. Uh, I learned, you know, hey, I could hit really hard. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, I was, you know, I was strong even back then, um, you know. And so I, I, I started tuning myself up, you know. I started to where I like to fight. You know, I, I, I like the pain, you know, of people hitting me and, and me hitting back, you know. Uh, I like the feeling of being able to hit back. Uh, and so uh, I learned early on that, you know, if you fight and uh, you you win, people will leave you alone. You get to have you occupy your own space. But yeah. I, I didn't like, it's not that I enjoyed fighting. I just, I, I just didn't like bullies. You weren't afraid to fight. I wasn't afraid to fight, and I, I was a bully breaker. You know, I, I didn't like bullies, and as I got older, I, I made it my mission. When I'd see one of the older kids picking on the littler kids, I, I'd say, hey, it ain't happening, you know. You, you know, uh, you're not going to be, you're not picking on them, you're not hitting them, you're not, you're not, that's not going to happen. All of that was you fighting Bill, basically. I, absolutely, yeah. and a lot of people have never put that together, you know. Uh, uh, it was one big challenge, it was me being able to finally fight back, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so you, uh, after the, after the military and mm-hmm. you were doing your own thing, mm-hmm. you got, you got into drugs, right? I got into drugs. Yeah. One of my friends 
friends uh, had uh, introduced me to speed, mm. methamphetamine, um, and has plagued me my life over, you know. Uh, um, methamphetamine is not, not, not something to fuck around with, man, because once it's in your system... Yeah. That that thing is a demon. It is a demon. And it's not, you know, people say, oh, it's not addicting. Bullshit. Uh, it's not physically addicting. Nope. But in your mind, you know, you, your mind, you're counting the moments until you can, you know, when I was in the penitentiary, I went to penitentiary four times. And all I did was count the moments until I could get out and, and, and get, get high again, you know. I was, uh, the first time I got out of prison, before I got out of the bus station, I was hiring draft pussy. Oh, can I, I can't say that. <laughs> but, I mean. You can say whatever you want, man. Man, I mean, that's pretty high. You know, draft you know, <laughs> stuff is pretty high. But anyway, so that's what I equate that to. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and I'm, I just think back at it now, and I say, man, how stupid was I, you know? And the whole time I thought I was clever, you know? And, and, and I guess... And I am, I, God has blessed me with a, a pretty good mind. You know, there's nothing that I, nowadays there's nothing that I can't fix. You know, if I even, if there's, if I, if I can't fix, I mean, if there's something I don't know anything about, I can just watch a video on it or read a book and it's just, and do it just like if I was made to it, you know. But do you think, again, that that going back is you, you being a fixer is what you were trying to do with your mom with Bill you were trying to you were trying to fix the situation by taking the beating you were trying to fix the, the problem there you, you know, know I never I never really thought of it that way but that's exactly my whole life I've, I've always you know as I told y'all earlier that uh, you know I'm I, I'm a people person I want to please you know and the way that I could please is be able to fix whatever's broken you know only I could never fix myself, you know. I, I had a big hole in me, you know, and I, I tried to fill it with dope. And and you know, of course, at a young age, uh, you know, when I kind of when I got out of the service, I, I met these uh, certain group of guys, and uh, I gave them six months of my life, you know, and they to, and they taught me how to to cook, you know, uh, speed. You know, and the price of this, it's not free. It's not something that you that you can go to college and learn. It's not something that uh, you can go to class on. You know, it, it, this is life's class. You know, and so uh, I gave six months of my life to do, you know, to learn how to do this. And then after I learned how to do it, I had to cook for them for six months um, uh, as my payment, you know. And on my last cook and my... And the, at the end of the six months, uh, I got busted, you know, uh, mm. and uh, it wasn't a good scene. But um, and that was the first time you went. Yes, 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 yes. And it was the first time that I had uh, had gotten in trouble. Yeah. And so you got locked up, right? I did. I got locked up, and then I got out, you know, on bond, and then I. You were I, fighting the whole time you were in there too. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's the first thing that happens when you when you get to prison and get in jail. People, you know, people, you know, want to uh, test you to see who you are or whatever. You know, the thing about it is nowadays, man, I'm 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 just an old guy, man. I I don't I don't want to do that. My body just doesn't recover like it used to. You know, I'm like the old lady that's in the oh man, in I the mean, falling and I can't get up. <laughs> Comparatively to what most other people's bodies have been through, your your body has taken some damage. Oh me. yeah, I broke my back in two places, broke my uh, neck, and one you know I got screws in my neck, got pins in my back. Uh, I've been opened up in the front here from the top to the bottom where I was my all of my ribs were crushed, and that's broke. Each rib was broken more than three places. Um, my breastplate was in twenty two pieces, lacerated liver, lacerated spleen. My both my knees. I've had nine knee surgeries on one leg, six on the other. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty beat up. Hmm. But uh, I was never supposed to walk again. Um, but uh, what was what were, what were all those injuries from? There was like a like I, you've, different things, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, fall the, off a a tower. Or? No, I fell down some stairs. No, I'm just. <laughs> 
<laughs> just, uh, just uh, Bill. Bill yeah, stairs has got Bill's you stairs, again. Them damn stairs, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, so no, I was in a car wreck. I was riding with a friend, and um, he was going to show me how fast his uh, new Honda, his Honda, would run with the twin turbos. He'd pulled out of his garage and pulled over to my house. See, I had go karts and motorcycles. My all my kids have been riding since they was three years old you know old enough to hold up the motorcycle i got them little you know uh little pocket bikes and stuff i've had them on mm-hmm. pocket bikes and four wheelers since since they was old enough to squeeze the throttle but um here's the deal he you know before he backed out of his garage he turned up a bottle of vodka and drank the whole bottle put it down put him some big red gum in Stuck it in gear, backed up, pulled over to me and said, hey, you want to go with me to test out my turbos? Of course, you know what I said, hell yeah. And so uh, away we went. And about uh, five minutes into the ride, we're on the back roads. We're going towards, uh, I guess it'd be Siloam Springs. And we're running 90, 100 miles an hour. And he looks over at me and he says something I didn't really understand him, but he's slurring his words and his, you know, his eyes were trying to shut. And I said, dude, are you, have, did, was you drinking? How are you drinking? What's going on? He said, uh, yeah, a little bit. And at that point, I buckled my seatbelt. We was, we was running 100 miles an hour then. I never wore a seatbelt. But at that point, I'd reach over. I remember it just like it was yesterday. I reached over and put my seatbelt on. And by the time, by the, you know, I was looking down but to, so I could find the seatbelt, and I got it clicked, and I looked up, and he was slumped over the wheel. Mm. And I looked up, I looked, uh, and, you know, this was like in slow motion. I looked up, and we were right there in a curve, and I screamed. I said, dude! And he kind of woke up, and he snatched the wheel to the right to, try, I guess, try to go into the curve, but we was already past the curve, and... So that put us in a spin, and we hit the guardrail, went over the guardrail, and fell down the mountain uh, about, I guess it was a 90-foot, the first drop was 90-foot, we hit. And uh, let me tell you, that boy went all over. The, I tell you, I touched that, every piece of that car touched me. Uh, I was trapped inside the car. When it, when it finally come, you know, got to a stop, you know, uh, it was, there was smoke coming out of it, going up, going up the hill, and, and thankfully there was somebody behind us, you know, that had watched us go over the mountain because they had never found us. But um, he broke his arm. I I broke my back in two places, broke my neck. You know, some, I, my breastplate was in twenty-two pieces from the seat belt, crushed all my ribs. Mm. Uh, messed both my legs up pretty good. Um, and uh, I never lost conscious. You know, I, it was just another another beating that I, that car beat the hell out of me. Mm. But I remember that I looked over at him. He's still slumped over. I'm screaming at him, hey, I'm trapped. The car has, you know, the top of the car has crushed down on me. So I'm, I'm laying down, you know, kind of like, I'm laying like towards the dash, but the top of the car is on top of me. Pressed down. Pressed down on me. You know, there's an impre- an impression of my of, of my body in the in the hood. I mean, in the top of the car, where it's crushing me. And so I'm trying to open up my door. I can't get out. But you you got to understand, I was so broke up. I I couldn't even. I was using my arm trying to be real careful, because uh, I I knew I was hurt. Mm-hmm. And I was getting it was getting hard for me to breathe, <clears throat> and uh, I, I just felt like uh, you know I I really felt like it was the end for me. And but I was screaming at the guy, and I said, "Man, you got to get out! You got to get." He said, "No, you get out." I said, "Dude, I'm trapped. I can't get out. I can't even move towards you." And so he finally gets his door. Open. He all he did was break his arm, and he did break it oh, pretty shit. good too. Yeah, bro. I mean, it just hung there, you know. And uh, so he grabbed up his arm and he got out. But by that time, I could, you know, it would seem like maybe 20 minutes or whatever. I could hear ambulances in the background, fire trucks and stuff like that. And I was thinking, man, I hope they're coming for us. And uh, they finally got to the site. I heard a helicopter come in. And uh, 
he was all bloody because it hit his head. And so everybody had run to him. You know, I didn't have no blood on me or nothing. He, there wasn't a mark on me. It was all internal. It was all internal. That's what, and I'm going to get to that part of the story. <clears throat> and so they uh, they all run to him, and they're, they're working on him and everything. And the, the, the lady paramedic said, well, how are you doing? I said, I'm dying. And I want you to tell my wife that I love her and that she and the kids <clears throat> were the last thing that I was thinking about. And so um, she said, oh, you're all right. You're not bleeding. You're not. I said, I, I can't breathe. You know, and my breath was getting shorter. And so she started, she listened um, to my chest and she started screaming. It scared, scared the hell out of me when she started screaming. I thought she was screaming at me, you know. And, uh, and what she was screaming is all the other paramedics were over there helping that guy because he was all bloody because... You know, he just had a little cut on his head, but it bled a bunch. Mm -hmm. But it looked like it was much worse, you know, by, by looking at him. So she starts screaming at them to get the, to get the, the jaws or whatever, get the, the, and so they could cut the car away from me and everything. Well, come to find out, I really was dying, and I knew I was dying. I was drowning in my blood. One of my lungs had, uh, had uh, uh, the rib had punctured my lung. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, my lung was filling up with blood, and I was literally drowning. And so she, they, they were cutting on the car, and they, they wow. finally cut me out of there, and they got me on a stretcher, and they stuck this tube down my throat, pumped out, pumped, you know, blood out, or, and and then start. They put me on oxygen, and as I, and then they were trying to put me on this little stretcher, and I was a pretty big old boy, you know, I, I was pretty heavy then because uh, I'd gained a lot of weight, you know, when I really wasn't having to, you know, fight or anything anymore. And so I was, you know, I sat back and I'd gotten lazy and started getting big. And <clears throat> so they was trying to put me in a helicopter and I remember I couldn't fit into the, the, to the place. So I pulled my legs up as hard as I could and then they finally got the little, the cart clicked in to the helicopter so that it would be safe and I could, you know, I could ride on the helicopter. And uh, I remember looking down on me, down, you know, she said, we'll see you at the emergency room. Uh, they're going to give you a ride here. You're going to be okay. Uh, you know, uh, just keep breathing. Make yourself breathe. And that was the last thing I finally did. She said, gave me a big shot or something. Or, and I finally did go to sleep. Uh, or not go to sleep, but pass out or whatever. And I remember I woke up once at the hospital, but it was a haze. And then after that, I didn't wake up for, I think it was 21 more days or whatever. I think 11 days I woke up myself, and then after that, they put me in a drug-induced coma uh, for 11 more days. But here's the deal. They, they called my wife. You know, that lady, I made her promise me that she would call my wife, and I gave her my number. They called her. She came up to the hospital, and the doctors told her that she might want to go in and visit with me, that I probably wouldn't make it through the night. They said, there, you can't tell it, but he's broken from, he broke everything inside of him. He's, 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 his insides are mush, you know. And uh, when I woke up, I was black. You know, my, uh, my lower body was black, you know, from, from all yeah. of the bruising and stuff, so... But she said uh, when she went in there, I was already, you know, out. But it looked like I was just sleeping. Uh, there was no marks on me. She said the marks didn't start coming till the next day and the day after. And it just got worse and worse and worse. You know, and uh, they, after the third day, they said, well, I, it looks like he's trying to improve. If he makes it another couple of days, I think we'll be out of the woods, you know. And but then I was in a coma, you know. So for I was in a coma for eleven days, and then when I did wake up, I tried to fight to get off of the uh, the stretcher, and they was trying to hold me. And I pulled one of the nurses over the stretcher and and put her on the floor on the other side, <laughs> and uh, so they they tied me up, tied me to the deal to keep me from pulling myself apart. You know, uh, I was mm -hmm. all, I was all broke up, but I didn't know what I was doing. You know, when I woke up, I was all groggy. Yeah, and they had me, you know, tube down my throat. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was choking to death, and 
and I thought they was trying to kill me, you know. So I was, I, I fought back, you know. I was trying to, trying to get that tube out of me. What it was, I couldn't breathe, and I really couldn't. They had to keep me on life support. Uh, you know, they put me in a, a drug-induced coma for 11 more days, and then when they woke up, I stayed three more days on a, the, the breathing machine uh, because I couldn't breathe by myself. My, I just, no matter what, you know, I tried to breathe, but I couldn't. You know, so they kept pumping air into me so that I could, uh, our oxygen, so that they could keep me alive. But anyway, that's a that's a an, another story. That's Man, just a little side. I don't story. think I'd ever heard that story. No, you haven't. <laughs> wow. But you were, you were already married at that point, right? I was married. And so yeah. you, had, you had you had your kids. So I that was just that had my little girl. My little girl was my, the last one, uh, Corinne, and uh, in the hospital. Uh, my wife would come see me in the hospital, and she'd lay Corinne on top of my chest. On, even though I was broke. Corinne was so light that she could put her right there on my chest, and she would sleep there, and I, I could put my hands on her, and I could hug her. And uh, so, anyway, yeah. Wow, man. Well, we've said it all, man. We've said, we've said it all, and we've said plenty. There, there's... No doubt in my mind that they're gonna. I'm gonna get messages like, "Hey, you need to have John back on. Let's let's hear more from John." So, well, they're definitely gonna want to hear the rest because you know <laughs> it's just now getting you know getting interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't even know the rest. So, everything we covered today is pretty much what I knew and then some. So, yeah, I'm excited it, to hear the next part. Well, there's there's plenty more, but. <laughs> um, you know, we're going to laugh a lot more on the next one, you know, because uh, uh, it's just some funny mistakes that I've made and, and, and you know, um, things that I've done that, uh, you know, you can't, you can't, it really can't fix stupid. And sometimes <laughs> I am really stupid. You know, so. All right, man. Hey, I like you, who you are, dude. I love you, Ben. I and, appreciate uh, you, man. And, and, and I, I couldn't have a better friend. Uh, you know, I mean. We don't sit there and uh, shoot texts back and forth, but uh, you know where I stand and I know where you stand. Yep, absolutely. Yep, yes, sir. All right, man. Thanks for hanging out. You bet, man. All right, bud. Later.